an outside the passive house. Looks like a barn. Oh, hello. My name's Pete Smith. And this is the passive house that we've built over the last five years. My wife have been living here for, my wife and I have been living here for two years. And I'm going to take you on a bit of a tour of it, but explain what are the features that make up a passive house. So please come inside. Well, the term passive house is coined because it actually tries to use energy that we gain passively from the sun. So with big south facing windows, the sun comes through the, and strikes onto the concrete floor. But I'll go into a bit of that later on. So the essential features of a passive house are, apart from that passive solar gain, that it has the right building configuration. It's the right shape not to waste heat through extraneous external walls. And that this building has got that. Secondly, um, it needs to be designed along the lines of the, the uh, passive house movement prescribe. So you enter all the data that you've got about the building you intend to build into the computer package, the uh, passive house planning package, and that tells you then how thick the insulation should be, for example, the maximum size of the windows, in order to achieve the passive house standard, which is about low energy use for space heating particularly. Now the, the, that's broken down into a number of features which um, I'll, I'll address individually. So for example, windows and doors have to be to a certain specification. Um, the insulation of the building has to be such that it maintains the heat without losing too much. It's got to be um, airtight to a, a, a specific standard. This building is airtight to 0.4 air changes per hour whereas our old Victorian house in Middlesbrough was 10 air changes per hour. In other words, it has no drafts. It's got a special ventilation system, which we'll have a look at, and um, it's also uh, got to be heated in a suitable way for a passive house. An airtight building, for example, can't have an open gas fire or an open wood-burning stove. That would be burning up the air that you're going to breathe. This chap has nothing to do with the presentation, but he, he was acquired by my son. Um, I'm not quite sure how, but uh, he's lived with us for years now, so we'll leave him there. Right, I'm coming downstairs now. So, at night, we shut external shutters on these windows. I'll now demonstrate. This is a tilt and turn passive house sliding door and there's the view we're lucky enough to get from it now this is a, a typical of the windows it's triple glazed argon filled with a timber frame and you'll see that it's set in the middle of the wall that's a crucial point a lot of modern buildings nearly all modern buildings have the window frame set in the outside leaf of the wall what you do with this is you protect the wooden frame by insulation and timber so that it lasts much longer and it's thermally much more efficient and um, virtually 100% airtight. Mm -hmm. If we move across here and look at another window, <coughs> so this window in the kitchen, similar construction, triple glazed, argon filled. You can either have it in this tilt mode or you can open it fully. Now you don't want to open the windows in a passive house in the winter. The idea is to retain all the heat that you've got in the building. You don't need to open the window for fresh air. I'll explain why later. You can see again that that window is in, set in the middle of the wall and the sides of the window called the reveals are flared to enable light to come in from an angle and that 
means you can have a smaller window to gain more light and of course lose less heat. Now we're trying to retain the heat that's in the building. How does the heat get in the building? Well the people that are in it each give off 100 watts. The, um, the uh, just washing up in hot water gives off heat. The uh, dishwasher uh, gives off heat when it's operating and so throughout the building the white goods are giving off heat the um, cooker behind you is giving off considerable heat if you're using it to bake something. That heat you want to keep in the building and not lose by having open windows or through drafts. Mm. Now if we move around here into this area of the house so how do you breathe in a passive house, which is airtight and um, uh, may have as many as a dozen people in it, although it's only my wife and I live here? Well, you draw in fresh air from outside and that fresh air goes through this extraordinary machine here, which is called a me mechanical ventilation heat recovery unit. The fresh air goes into a heat exchanger Mm -hmm. The spent air, which you've breathed and has gone out through the bathrooms, comes in through other pipes and gives its heat to the fresh air that's coming in. That's the essential part of the building. It's 93% efficient, so you're getting fresh air 24 hours a day via a fan inside here, and you're not losing heat by op opening windows. Mm. It, it, it means that the building, as I said, is draft proof. Also, if you open a window or a door, you don't get a great gust of air coming in because the pressure in the building, there's nowhere for it to go, it stops there. Right, so we keep the heat that's already in the building, but that's not sufficient if it's minus 10 degrees outside, for example, or even two degrees outside. That won't keep the building at a comfortable temperature, which we think is about between 18 and 19 on average degrees centigrade. So we have underfloor heating operated from an air source heat pump but we don't use that because we're fortunate enough to have a wood supply and we have a wood burning stove. Now this wood burning stove will burn one ton in a year of wood which equates to half a ton of carbon and produces 1.6 tonnes of carbon dioxide which is extremely favourable compared with either oil or whatever else you produce, colour gas I suppose, in this sort of setting. The features of this stove that make it unusual are that it's got an external air supply. So it's completely independent in air terms of the rest of the house. And the wood that we burn, we make sure it's dried to 14% moisture content or below. That's very important to avoid toxic particulates being given off for those people that are interested in reading more about the, the technical aspects of the Passive House, this book is excellent, the Passive House Handbook. It's the Bible of builders to Passive House standards. So um, one of the things it advocates is that you should try to use building materials with as little embodied energy as possible. The embodied energy of a house probably equates to half of the total energy required to heat it throughout the life of the building, depending how long the building lasts, of course. So it's a huge amount. And what we've tried to do in this building is to use recycled materials where possible, so you're actually continuing to lock up carbon that's already been sequestered, for example, in the case of timber. So if you look here at some of the uh, building materials, you see that these big studs here, which are 250 by 150 millimetres. There's approximately 250 feet of, uh, I should be talking in metres, but never mind, of this material um, that came from a pontoon uh, in Wales where trains were able to go onto ferries to go to Ireland. And a local scrap uh, company demolished the, 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 the structure and I bought the lot. And you can see, if you look at some of the uh, the grain here, how um, remarkable it is. It's um, probably from uh, Russia or the Baltic, red wood. Um, each piece was tested by a structural engineer to ensure it would bear the weights that we wanted on it. So that's a feature throughout the building. This staircase here is made of elm, which came from largely from one tree actually in 
uh, Kirby College grounds in Middlesbrough. And that elm had got Dutch elm disease, which didn't affect its structural strength or the beauty of the timber. And I've had that for 20 years. I've got it cut up on site by a, a New Zealander with a wood miser horizontal band mill. And then that, oh, that enabled me to build the staircase and all the doors upstairs. The elm for these doors came from, I think it was Picton. There was a lot felled because of Dutch elm, elm disease. And again, I got that. I was able to um, uh, use that for the majority of the woodwork. The floorboards are recycled scaffolding boards, mm -hmm. which are, are always available. If there's a, a slight bit of damage to a scaffolding board, it has to be condemned and replaced. Oh, yes. So in addition to mm -hmm. those, uh, the, the, the timber, which is recycled, you can go in there, yeah? Yeah. Mm. So in addition to the timber, um, we also have got a recycled stainless steel uh, kind of luxury fire escape out here. <laughs> and 6,000 bricks that were used in the structure up to the, the one metre high um, uh, where, where timber begins outside. Those 6,000 bricks came from St Patrick's Church in, um, in Middlesbrough and also from North Allerton Prison, so a rather unholy combination of origins there. Um, but each brick, a new brick, takes half a key, uh, creates half a kilo of CO2, so there's three tonnes of CO2 saved on that. We reckon that we, we saved, as it were, 40 tonnes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere by using these recycled materials, which also include the steel frame for this um, uh, portal frame. So an another um, uh, climate change positive feature, if you like, is that the building is furnished with furniture that we've acquired over a, a long period, 40 years probably. We didn't chuck everything out in house clearance when we moved here in order to stick with one particular aesthetic, which is, is, is often the case in the grand designs programs where you see people adopting a minimalist um, aesthetic in the way they've got the furniture and so forth. So 95% at least of the furniture is either and fittings is either second hand um, or I've made it myself. Um, and we don't like really the idea that you know every five years you chuck out your kitchen and get a new one, which is pretty disastrous in terms of the uh, materials. Is it, is it all positive living in a passive, passive house? Well, mostly there's, there's a couple of downsides uh, the atmosphere is very dry and my wife particularly suffers from dry eyes at night so we have a humidifier in the bedroom that could be overcome probably by having some large house plants um, or a, as we've got there a, a saucepan of water on top of the wood burning stove what can't you do in a passive house well you can't smoke but you shouldn't anyway um, you can't and you, why would you want to install air extractors in the bathrooms you don't need that because there's permanent 24 hour a day air extraction from the bathrooms going into the heat exchanger and then delivering fresh air through the likes of that, mm. which is the, uh, the, the, the um, input of air that's gone through the heat exchanger. You can't use a gas cooker, you've got to have an electric cooker because the gas would be burning up the air that's in the building. You can, I suppose, light candles, so we don't because mm. it's a wooden building. You can't run a tumble dryer, but you don't need to, because if you hang your clothes up there, <laughs> everything dries overnight. Hmm. Now that saves something like 1,000 kilowatt hours per year of electricity. That's the average cost of running a tumble dryer. Hmm. That is not an insignificant amount. What's good about living in a passive house as well, is that those minor disadvantages, is of course the energy costs are extremely low. The wood is free, but if we had to use an um, underfloor heating, that would that would be an electricity cost, which is modified by the use of the um, air source heat pump. So the air source heat pump costs about 5p per kilowatt hour to run the underfloor heating, as opposed to the 15p for a kilowatt of electricity. Mm. So um, the, 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 there are big savings there. 
Our total electricity bill for all the equipment we run in the house is, well, it's not, the, the bill's not important, it's the kilowatt hours, is 5,000 kilowatt hours per um, year, which equates to about two pounds a day of expenditure, which runs a whole variety of things in the house and also the sewage treatment plant that we have outside. So, much more economical. Probably the best thing is the extreme comfort that you feel throughout the house. Yeah. Everywhere's the same temperature approximately. You don't have cold spots. You don't go into a bedroom and think, blimey, you know, you're shocked by the cold. Everything's about the same temperature. And it doesn't go down, even if you switch off all the heating, it tends to maintain its temperature and only lock, drop by one or two degrees a day until you put some external heat in. Well, I suppose it's a complete piece of luck that the government five years ago introduced a piece of legislation that said you could convert a barn into a, a dwelling house, amongst many other things, um, through what's called permitted development. Now, if that hadn't happened, I don't think we'd have got permission to do this conversion. This is not something that this building could be copied elsewhere really it's a bit of a one-off mm. but it has features that can be built into any new building uh, any new domestic building if you look at the sterling prize winner for this year which was um, an estate of um, social housing in Norwich you'll see there all the passive house principles um, and, and embodied in, in those buildings so it's the future of low energy building and that's what I wanted to get involved in. And uh, I, I've got to say, um, one of the things that enabled me to do it was by employing an Eritrean refugee who was a, uh, before he came here, he, he was a shepherd in a, a village in Eritrea without electricity and uh, uh, an extremely bright fella who after eight years managed to get to this country. And when I met up with him, he'd hardly used a hand saw or uh, uh, tools, he quickly, got hold of the idea of air tightness and he became the kind of air tightness champion and did most of the, um, the, the uh, uh, um, fabric of the building in terms of air tightness to get us the, st the standard of uh, 0.4 air changes per hour and we both have a t-shirt which says the tightest guys in town <laughs> and that chap um, I worked with him for a year and a half he was exceptional uh, and if only he could go on and do something great, I think he, he ought to. Pity he's not in his own country, where, which desperately needs people like that, but 